Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Blasted videos get me every time. <laughs> I should know it. I've, I've seen enough of those. They never get old, but, you know, when it's your, fr I was just thinking as I was watching that, uh, Jim and Ty, your dear friends of ours, and man, it matters. It always matters, right? But when it's your son, when it's your daughter, when it's your neighbor, when it's your coworker's child, when it's your grandchild, man, it's different. And uh, that's the generation that we get to reach into and speak into. And so thank you for being a church that has done that, that continues to do that. Uh, I am grateful just to be some small part of that. So, well, uh, we're glad you're here today. If we have not had the, the privilege of meeting, <clears throat> as I get myself straightened out, uh, my name is Chris. And I get to be one of the pastors around here, and it is a privilege. Uh, what we do is hard, uh, but it is such a beautiful privilege to be a part of your guys' lives. We got some friends joining us online today. I had a couple of them reach out to me, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically. So uh, you know who you are. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining in. And I uh, thank you guys for being a part of today. As uh, Jim mentioned, we're in this six week series called Solomon Says where we're looking at the book of Proverbs and this just rich wisdom. Solomon was the wisest man ever to live. The scriptures say there was none before him as wise and there will be none after him as wise. And so we're looking at Proverbs and there are two main ideas that at the very outset, in the very first uh, few verses of Proverbs, Solomon tells us what it's about. He tells us why he's writing the book, what the purpose is, and there's these, these two big ideas that run as the theme. One of them is attaining wisdom, and the other is the fear of the Lord. So this idea of attaining wisdom, is, is the, the Hebrew word there for wisdom means applied knowledge or applied skill. In other words, the very first thing you need to know about Proverbs and why Solomon wrote Proverbs was not so we know stuff. It was not so we learn stuff. It was so we learn stuff and then we could do stuff and live a very different kind of life. It's applied knowledge. It's applied skill. So if you only learn things, if you only go, oh, wow, that's interesting. I had never thought of that. Then you've missed the point of Proverbs. It's this idea of applied skill or applied knowledge. And the second big idea that runs throughout the entire book is this idea of the fear of the Lord. And I've said before, it's not fear of the Lord like we think of it. It's not like fear of uh, freaky clowns. It's not that. It's this reverence or this awe of God, this, this recognition that there is a God and I am not him. God is God and I am not. And if there is a God and I am not God, that means that God sets the definitions and the boundaries of life, and it is mine to discover them, not to define them. In other words, what we said every single week is my narrative the narrative of my life finds its context within the narrative of God's bigger story. That's what the book of Proverbs is talking about and what Solomon's talking about when he talks about this idea of the fear of the Lord. So those two big themes run all throughout the book of Proverbs. Uh, last week, uh, Patrick spoke, did an incredible job. In fact, he taught the entire book of Proverbs. I have nothing left to teach today. Uh, it was incredible, though. And his single goal, he said it up front, was to encourage you, to inspire you, to challenge you to start reading Proverbs on a daily basis. I saw a lot of you do posts where you talked about the fact that you're taking that challenge. I know he got a lot of messages as well. It was incredible. I would encourage you to uh, go back online and watch. But I want to say this too. This is one other thing that I've set out every single week. Uh, it's just a thought for Proverbs. Proverbs are not promises, not by nature. They're not promises. They are principles. Now, there are tons of promises in the scripture that God makes to his people and to us, but Proverbs by nature are not promises. Now, they may match a promise that's found somewhere else in the scripture, but the nature of them is they are principles. And so with those things in tow, I just want to say up front 
uh, confession and disclaimer, this may not be the most inspirational message that you have ever heard, right? You may not walk out of here today ready to charge hell with a water pistol. It's not that kind of day. But before you check out, let me just say this. I do actually think that this may very well be some of the greatest life-altering potential in this message and what we're talking about today of anything, of almost anything I'll say that you could hear. And I would say this, it's not just if you hear it, it's if you attain wisdom. If you actually hear something today and go, I don't need to just hear that, I need to do it. So this is incredibly practical and very challenging to actually do. I will not say anything today that is difficult to understand. We'll talk about several things today that are very difficult to do. So to get us started, I want to show you some pictures that I took recently uh, on my commute to work. So the first one I want to show you and then get a little bit of feedback. All right, so my guess is your eyes are drawn to one or two things in this picture. What's the first thing you saw? Just yell it out loud. All right, 22 miles an hour, some of you said, and some of you saw the ducks, right? That was my thing that I figured most people were going to see. Now, this is my vehicle. Um, I don't really understand the duck thing. We have a Jeep, and people put ducks on my Jeep. Uh, I'm supposed to put them on other people's Jeep. I don't do that. I guess I don't play right. My kids do occasionally. I don't really even know what it's for, but that's what's going on. But that's 22 miles an hour, and I'm on an actual road going that speed limit. Now, I want to show you the next picture. Now, I tried to get a picture of the car in front of me, and I want to see if you guys can guess what you think the car in front of me actually is. I asked some people on our production team earlier, and one of them had the best guess. It was like, it's always got to be a Honda Odyssey with the, like the luggage rack on the top because all cars going to the beach with more than one kid are in a Honda Odyssey with a luggage rack on the top. It's a great guess, but it's not the right guess. So what, do you, what would you guess that that car is? Pizza delivery. Yeah, that's a good one. It's not Papa John's, but that is exactly what it looks like, and it's not any other pizza. Any other guesses? It is a student driver. That is it. It is a student driver. Now, the speed limit on this particular road is 35 miles an hour, I'd like for you to know. So uh, we have a lot of police officers uh, in our church. So if you're a police officer right now, if you're uh, here in the room, if you're watching online, I'd like for you just to plug your ears while I have an honest conversation with the rest of the church. Isn't it true, if while well, police officers are not listening, isn't it true that there's like a five mile and over grace zone where it's technically not speeding if you're in that? Like, would you guys all agree with that? Like, some of you are like, no, it's actually 10 miles an hour, right? <laughs> All right, police officers, you can elbow them. They can clear out their ears. Uh, for you police officers just rejoining, I would just like you to know, I was just telling the rest of the church that speeding is a sin. Even <laughs> one mile an hour over is a sin. So for me, this 22 miles an hour, it's like, I, I mean, a solid 15 to 18 miles an hour slower than how I, I felt like a couple of times I could get out and run faster. That's how, I, and I can't, like, I, I understand my age and my speed, but I felt as though that could happen. But the real disaster happened when we got to the turn lane. So there's two lanes over here, two lanes over here, and there's a lane in the middle that's the turn lane. This young, sweet girl was avoiding this turn lane like it had COVID. Like she was literally, she could, she would like get close to it, had her blink. She's way over in the other lane, which I'm in. I'm just trying to go straight through the light. She is avoiding this lane. So she's got her blinker on like a whole lane over. And then she'd get over. It's like she's putting her foot in the edge of a hot water. She'd get over, touch it a little, and then come back and touch it. And then she got half the car over. So... I did what any good Christian would do. I blew past her, sat on my horn, shook my fist, and yelled really loud, right? Uh, I, did not, I did not do that because I have children, and I have a church bumper sticker on my car. So, uh, but I did think about it. I, th I thought about it. As I passed, I saw this little 15, 16-year-old girl, and she's in the car, and she's nervous. And I don't know if it's 10 and 2 or if it's what I, something's happening and I just kind of drive on by. But let me just say, if I were to say to you that this young girl, 15, 16, 17, I don't know how old she was. If I were to say, she's fool. She's a, she's a fool. She's foolish. Some of you are like, that, that sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? Like, we wouldn't immediately think that she's a fool. We wouldn't immediately think she's foolish. That, you say, Chris, it's not that. She's just inexperienced. She doesn't have reps. She, she's a novice. She's not done this. It's interesting. One of the contrasts that we find throughout the book of Proverbs is this contrast between the wise and the foolish. One of the things that Solomon uh, introduces, he teaches that there's a type of wisdom. There's a type of wisdom that comes simply 
from having lived a little bit of life. You've done a few laps around the sun. You've just, you've got a few years. There's something you know 10 years in that you didn't know five years in. There's something you know 30 years in that you didn't know 20 years in. There's a type of wisdom that comes simply from having lived a little bit of life. And conversely, Solomon introduces this idea that there's a type of foolishness that comes not because you're innately foolish, not because you just like want to make bad decisions, but there's also a type of foolishness that comes simply because you are inexperienced. You just haven't seen enough life. You haven't done enough life. So if you're young, don't be offended. Solomon said it, not me. But if you are older, remember yourself. You know it's true, right? There are certain things that we know now not to do because we did them, right? And, and it hurt, or it hurt someone, or it was a bad decision, and for years we tried to get out of it. And the reality is what ends up happening is many of us, Many of us, and maybe this is your story, if you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, many of us make decisions or we form habits even in those inexperienced years that shape all the years to follow. In fact, sometimes the decisions we make in those inexperienced years that technically is de defined as foolishness, some of the decisions we make there leave a wake of destruction and regret. So let me just say, if you're young, it's all relative, isn't it? Then this message is for you. And let me just say this. If you're older and you can look at your life and there's a few regrets, there's a few habits that you're still trying to kick, this message is for you, which means it's for me as well. There are a few places that this idea, the, the foolishness and the wisdom and the experience and all of this, there are a few places that this surfaces more. Then in our response to, our, our handling of, and our relationship to money. Or should I say, money, 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 money. It was your part. I thought you were going to miss it. Somebody came strong. Uh, I asked the production team. I said, if I do that, is anybody going to sing? They're like, I don't know. They're like, it's up to you. You try it. You know, your, your funeral, right? This is, here, here's the thing, though. What happens inevitably when someone like me standing on a stage like this says money, some of you immediately go, uh-oh, here we go. So let me, just, let me just say this. You can relax. Uh, there, there are some of you that have had a bad relationship when it comes to church and money and what church does with money and all that stuff. So let me just set that aside for a second and just say, this isn't about that today. This is about something that God, by way of Solomon, this is about something that God wants for you, for your future, for your life. This isn't about something that anyone wants from you. And so in this, there's an incredible amount of wisdom. Solomon is going to unpack some things. I'm going to read a few Proverbs that are written by Solomon about the idea of money or about the realities of money, that if you attain wisdom, if you actually put some skill to this or some action to this, if you do it, I think it will actually change your life. Now, to do this, in order to convince you to take Solomon's advice, I want to tell you and share with you what happened when I didn't. <laughs> Just, just one of the many occasions. There, there's, I was thinking about, there's a reason this series is called Solomon Says, not Chris Says, right? Uh, Solomon, very wise. Chris, it's real iffy sometimes, right? So uh, don't raise your hands on this, but I just want you to think about this. Uh, how many of you, if you were to think about your childhood, if you were to think about your younger years, and again, don't raise your hands, how many of you would think to yourself that you grew up poor, right? Like, or... And maybe the way I would say it is that you, 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 had an envis you envisioned it that you were poor. Like maybe you weren't actually poor, but you thought you were poor. And here's the news flash. Relative to the rest of the world, none of us here today are poor. Like some of you have heard the stats. If you uh, are in a household, if either you make this or you're in a household that makes $50,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of the world's wage earners, which means you're not poor. If you drove here today, if you have a car, if some of you have multiple cars, some of you had a car when you were 15 or was waiting on you when you were 13, you were just hoping it would still run by the time you were 15 or 16, right? But if you have a car, let alone multiple cars, you're in the top 2% of the world's wealth. Now, it doesn't mean you feel wealthy. It doesn't mean you feel rich. But comparatively speaking, none of us in this room are poor. But I remember growing up thinking my dad had an asphalt business. And so during the summers, we, we'd do two things. He had a construction business as well. We did some construction, but in the summers, we paved driveways. And I distinctly remember in my middle school and high school years, 
I remember paving driveways and paving private tennis courts of classmates. Like, we would go to their house, pave the tennis court in the driveway. It's like, hey, there's our classmate Chris out there doing that. So I remember there was times, even though we weren't poor, I remember there was times where I felt as though there was a disparity. And there was a true disparity, but I felt as though we were poor. So when Angie and I first got married, um, our combined household income before taxes was $33,500. And I, we were working full-time jobs. That wasn't like working part-time. That was a full-time job. We were living in Charlotte, North Carolina, which, as you know, is an expensive city to live in. And uh, we were poverty level, but we were blissfully unaware. Like, I don't know. We didn't really know. And so early in our marriage, and when I say early, I'm talking about like weeks into our marriage. One day, I was at Best Buy, mistake number one. <laughs> at Best Buy, I saw this sound system that I couldn't afford, but I needed it. Like, I didn't, I didn't want it. Like, there was a hole in my heart. There was, like, I, my life was incomplete, y'all. And I, I just, I couldn't deal with this hole in my heart, but I couldn't afford it. And so I'm looking, this sales rep comes over. He can tell. He's like, I'm like, yeah, I can't afford that. But never fear, because the Best Buy card, credit card, is here. And he tells me, he's like, hey, I can get you signed up for one of these cards. And he says, that can be in your house today. I'm like, I was like, man, I, I can't afford it. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. He said, I'll put it on the card. I was like, well, how much would I owe today? He said, zero. I'm like, tell me more. I'm like, this feels like a, a gift from God. This is manna from heaven. God is speaking. What, what would I do to reject this gift of God? Like, and I'm just thinking, and I'm looking at the sound system, and he's pushed the test button, and I've heard it, and the subwoofer was making my heart feel something, right? And, and so I bought it. I put it all on the credit card. And I went home to my new wife. So Angie wasn't actually there yet. She was at work. I, well, I'll never forget this. She was actually at work. And I, here's what I thought. I, I thought, I'll assemble this thing. I'll put it together and I'll put it all away before she gets home. And she'll never notice. And it'll be fine. Now, in retrospect, I understand there were just a couple holes in my plan. I'm not, looking back, I, I, under, I understand this. Um, my frontal lobe was not fully formed as a human. I was young when I got married. Um, but now as I look back, I realize, so this should have been a discussion, not just a decision, like with my new wife. This, this should have been a thing that happened. Um, the second thing that was a problem in this is my wife, Angie, is really smart, and she is really observant. There was no way that she was not going to notice that there was a new surround sound system at our house. So there's that. And then the other problem, there's two more. There's actually about 10. I just put the top four in there. Um, er, anyone who knows me knows that I can't assemble anything, and I certainly can't assemble it fast. And that was all part of the plan. The plan was I got to put this thing together fast, and I got to make it work. And then the last problem was I didn't have the money to pay it off immediately, which meant that very quickly the high interest rates were going to kick in, the interest rates. And so that was going to be my reality. So Angie came home, and I kid you not, I was in the middle of the floor with boxes and wires literally everywhere, like they had attacked me, right? So I'm sitting there, she walked in, and she, said, she says, what you doing? And I said, we bought a sound system, a surround sound. It's great. Now, um, I would just like to say, in, in defense of myself, uh, some of you are like, no, you don't get to do that right now, Chris. That's what, that's what Angie said as well. In defense of myself, we had that surround sound until three years ago when we sold our house, all right? So it made a good run, but I paid about four times a month. Don't clap for me. This is not that moment. <laughs> Story's not over. <laughs> here's, here's what happened. This was the beginning of a journey that became a pattern of borrowing from the future to pay for the present. I, I didn't, it seemed so innocent in the moment. Yeah, we'll pay it off. It's no big deal, whatever. We're, we're making loads of money, 35K, whatever it was. Like, you know, it, it was, it wasn't, you're not thinking that way, right? It was an emotional decision, but it started a pattern to borrow from the future if I couldn't afford it to pay for the present. And I'm telling you, it took us over a decade to get back to even, not just that purchase, but the pattern of thinking that was created. And here's what I found. You know, there were so many times in our life that we were just at poverty level. We were poor, and I would look around, and here's what happens. It happens to you as well. You look to your right. You look to your left. If you're a teenager, you look and everybody's got all the gadgets and all the gears, all the things. If you're a college student, if you're a young married, everybody's going out to eat at places you can't afford. You look to your right and your left and you just go, I have to live at that standard. 
Here's what happens for a lot of young couples. They try to start off at the standard that their parents were when they left the home. And you're looking left, right, up, and around, and everything in you in an affluent city like Charlotte, you're just pressed into this thing. I've got to chase. I've got to chase. I've got to live beyond it. And I'm just telling you, what happened was there was a pattern that was kind of deep in us that it was easy in those moments to resort to bad habits. It's so much more difficult to create good habits than it is to just fall back into the old bad habits. It's so hard to create a new rhythm. Listen, let me, let me just say this. If you're here and you're not married yet, the number one cause of divorce in the U.S. finds its origin in some kind of money, spending, or budget fights or disagreements. Number one cause. This is a really big deal. So Solomon leans in. With all of his wisdom, he leans in and he tells us. He gives us advice. Again, advice that if you don't do anything with it, won't change your life. It's pretty much like all the advice. We see James saying some of the same stuff as you get to his book in the New Testament. But he's, this is advice that if we were to take it, it frames, I think, some of the best advice around money that you will ever hear. And if you lean in even a little bit, it may change your life. It may change your future. It may save your marriage. So I want to look at three Proverbs with the time that we have left. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. But three Proverbs around money. The first one found in Proverbs chapter 22, verses, verse 7. And this is what it says. It says, the rich <clears throat> rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Now, this is really strong language, potentially offensive language, depending on where you are in culture. He says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave. It's like a slave relationship to the lender. Now, don't hear what Solomon is not saying. Uh, Solomon is not speaking to right and wrong here. In other words, he isn't saying that the rich should rule over the poor. He's just saying that years of wisdom and experience, watching generations of this play out, this is what typically happens, that when you are rich, you are positioned to rule over. Again, he's not speaking to right or wrong. In fact, I would say the opposite. If you were here uh, week one of this series, when I launched in, one of the things that I talked about, there's a proverb that I introduced that says that the righteous, when the righteous, those who are living their life by God's way, when the righteous prosper, in other words, when, they ble when they're blessed, we talked about the blessed life, when they're blessed, that the entire city celebrates. Because when the righteous are blessed, they raise the water level for everyone. So Solomon isn't saying it's right for the rich to rule over the poor. In fact, he would say when the rich do, are doing it God's way, it raises the level of everyone around him. But he's saying the reality is that wealth positions us sometimes at the head of the class, at the head of the pack. And that oftentimes, sometimes it's done, done right, sometimes it's done poorly, but the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Now, I also in this in this verse, I don't see Solomon calling debt a sin. Like, some people would say that, but when you look through the scripture, you'll be hard-pressed to find it called a sin. But he is 100% saying that debt is unwise. And here's why. It places you in this debt-debtor relationship. What it does, debt steals your freedom by borrowing from your future. What you're doing is you're reaching into your future. You're reaching into your future income to pay for your current desires. That's what you're doing. Something you can't afford, but you're like, well, but in the future I'll be able to. So I'm going to reach into the future. I'm going to use that to pay for the present. And what it does is it steals your future. It impacts your future. It changes your future. Let me give you an example of this, just a practical example. The average car payment in the U.S., $500 a month. Some a little bit less, some a little bit more. In order to get that car, most people can't afford the new car. So they're going to have to reach into the future from a future paycheck, and they're going to have to bring that back into the current and get a loan, and they're going to have to pay on that loan with high interest, right? So $500 a month is average. So if you were to take that same $500 a month that many of us, most of us, some of us have on multiple cars, right? If you were to take that and put that same $500, instead of reaching into your future, borrowing from your future to do this now, if you were to take that same $500 and you were to put it just in a mutual fund between the ages of 30 and 70, even at the terrible yields that there are right now, you would end up with a million, if not millions, versus having debt. Literally, it's a picture of it steals from your future. 
Perhaps um, you've heard this saying. I heard someone say this early on in ministry, and it stuck with me, that you don't break principles. You just break yourself against them. None of us are going to break this principle that Solomon is talking about. You won't be the first one. We just break ourselves against the principle. But some of you hear this and you go, but Chris, it's too late. That would have been really great when I was 15. If I'd heard it or if I'd done something with it when I heard it, or when I was 20 or when I was 25 or when I was 30. In order to either get out of debt or not get in debt, let me just tell you what you have to have. You have to have a plan. It's not enough just to be inspired by what Solomon says. And you're like, well, of course. Of course I would love to do that. You have to have a plan. I remember um, many years ago, Angie and I were doing a course called Financial Peace University. Some of you have done that. I highly recommend. Uh, we were so poor. Again, it was one of those seasons of life. And I had this truck with 250,000 miles on it. Yes, it was paid for, right? 250,000 miles. And I sold it, got $2,500 for it. I don't know how I did that. $2,500 for it. And it was to start a, a, an emergency fund and pay off some debts and really start the process of getting us into a healthier place. So there were five of us in the household at that time. Two of us were driving, two of us working, and we had one car that was barely functioning. And so, I, you know, ch trade one unwise decision for another. So here I am. I've started this emergency fund emergency fund, but I had no idea what I was going to do next. Like, I remember it was on a Saturday, showed up to church the next day, and in the four-year, Angie was talking to somebody, and she told him, Chris sold our truck, you know, like, and so uh, they're like, well, what are you going to do? She's like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. We got a call not too long, maybe that same day, a couple invited us over to their house, said, hey, we have this, and they gifted us a 19, I'll never forget, a 1995 four-door blue Mercedes. I'm like, yeah, I'm rolling in it now, right? And here's the thing, every time I stopped, and this thing was such a gift, it was such a gift from God, but every time I stopped to get gas, I had to fill up the oil and top off the gas. It was one of those kind of situations, right? But here's what, here's what I believe. In this, in this moment, as we started to take, we, we worked on a plan. I believe God honored it, and, and I believe he'll do that for you. I think it was just a small thing of God saying, hey, I'm with you in this. I want this freedom for you. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to steal from your future to pay for the current. I want this kind of freedom. And I just want to encourage you. I think that some of you, if you step into this space or you're already in this space of trying to eliminate, you're trying to get rid of your school debts or of student loans or whatever's going on in your world, I just want to encourage you, stay on the path. I think there'll be some moments along the way where God will step in. He will, he will let you know that and remind you that you're doing the right thing. Uh, we did something called the debt snowball. Some of you have heard of this. Or you take the smallest amount, like if you've got a card that has a little bit on it, you pay that off, and then you take that payment, and you move it to the next card. And then you pay that off, and then it's a bigger amount. You take all of that and move it to your car payment. And then when you pay that off, you take all that and move it to your student loans, and then all that and move it to your house. It's called a debt snowball way to get out. But all I'm saying is debt is one thing. But you got to have a plan. You either have a plan if you're young not to ever get in it, or if you're in it, you have to have a plan to get out of it. And here's what Solomon says, the first piece of advice. Avoid debt. Get out of it. Eliminate it if you're in it. I want to give you two more quickly. This is what he says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. It says, in the house of the wise are stores of, stores of choice food and oil. Now, the basic idea here is that wise people save. Wise people save. In the Old Testament, oil represented the spirit of God. It, it, was, it was often, it burned in the Holy of Holies. It was often used to anoint kings. But in the marketplace, oil served as currency. Oftentimes, wealthy had it. It was what they used for currency, but it was a, it was a form of currency. So most people that were poor didn't have their choice food. They had to eat whatever came to them, whatever options were there. His, what Solomon is doing is he's painting this picture that the wise save, and as a result, they have choice food. Now, he says this. He says that they store up wealth. Why? Because they don't consume everything they have. In other words, they don't take 100% of what they have and spend 100% of what they have. He's saying one of the marks of wisdom is that you live on less than what comes in. America does not do this. We live on 110% of what comes in. That's the statistic. So he said the wise, though, they take a different approach. They live as if they know that there are unexpected things coming because the wise know that sometimes you have car accidents. I was in one this week. I did not plan for it. I did not expect it. The bills are still coming from it. 
The wise know that you're going to have doctor's appointments and dentist appointments. Have one of those this week too. The wise know that there are going to be disasters. The wise know that there are going to be pandemics. And they prepare for them. Even if they don't know when, they don't know how, they know I should not spend all that I have. And you live in a very different kind of way. The, the, the rest of this proverb says this. It says, in the house of the wise are, are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. I love how the NIV says this. It says, but a fool gulps his down. See, if you spend all of your check, if I spend all of my check on me, if you're too young to have a normal check coming in, think about time. It's the same principle. If you spend all that is given to you, all that's placed in your hand, time, resources, talent, whatever it is, if you spend all that on constructing a life for yourself, 100% of that, if you do that, then what's going to happen in multiple ways, you're not going to be prepared. You're not going to have the margin for friendships. You're not going to have the margin financially. You're not going to have the margin in your life to absorb what comes next. And you're not going to be prepared. Here's what Solomon says. He says, it's not wise. And again, if we spend 100% on ourselves, there's another thing at work too. And selfishness. Pat- Patrick, Patrick alluded to this last week. Solomon kind of paints this picture that beyond just the idea that it's not wise, that there is some level, there is some way in which we cross a moral line when we take and spend everything that we have on ourselves. At some point, it doesn't tell us when it is. I don't know when the, where the line is, but Solomon indicates that it becomes a moral issue when there is a world around us that needs us, and we take everything that comes our direction, and we pull it to ourselves, and we spend it on ourselves. That At some point, it becomes a moral issue, which makes sense when you understand that we are all sons and daughters of God, that we are built in the image of God, and so to not take care of someone else in the image of God, that there would be a moral dilemma. Solomon says, when we don't save, it's foolish, but it's also selfish. And when I was reading that, I was thinking, that's great advice, but here's the thing. Saving is not a plan. Saving is the outcome of a plan. Like Solomon can say, save. You're like, oh, that's great. That's not a plan. Saving is the outcome of a plan. See, when you save, you actually need something we call a budget. And that like, it feels like a dirty word, doesn't it? Like a budget is simply a way of taking your dollars, taking what comes in, and telling it where to go and when to go there. And when you have a budget, your ability to save increases exponentially. So two verses. Solomon says, eliminate debt or avoid debt at all costs. Because it's going to steal from your future. It's going to steal from your children's future. It's going to steal from your grandchildren's future. Avoid, eliminate debt at all costs. Second thing, he says, says, save. Because it's what the wise do. And then I want to give you one last one. And we'll wrap up. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. He says, a generous person will prosper. It means you're going to live with abundance. You're going to live with blessing. A generous person will prosper. In other words, he's saying when you give it away, you'll actually, you'll live differently. You'll live better. You're like, no, if I give it away, I'll live with less. No, he's saying, no, it's the opposite. If you give it away, you will live with prosperity. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Patrick made this statement last week that I thought was just fascinating and true, that for years now, scientific studies and research has been catching up to what Solomon said and what wisdom said many years ago. This is one of, those, one of these areas. Studies show that generous people are healthier. They have healthier emotions. They have healthier relationships. They have healthier perspectives on life that when you live with a sense of generosity, it impacts everything. There's this symbiotic relationship between generosity and our overall health. Now, this is the point where for people that grew up in church, um, the, the stuff starts to creep in. You start thinking about, you know, some of you grew up in a church that taught tithe, and you thought, I don't know if that's biblical, or I don't know if we should do that, or is that Old Testament, or is that New Testament, and where should the tithe go, and all those kind of things, which probably is a topic for another day. But I want to say this. When Jesus introduced to his followers, when he introduced this idea of generosity, the same kind of generosity that Solomon was talking about, he was speaking to a Jewish audience. Because a lot of the argument is that tithe is an Old Testament principle and Jesus introduced generosity, which I actually believe that to be true. But when he introduced generosity, he was speaking to a Jewish audience that was in the habit of between what was called the Levitical, the festival, and the charity tithes. They had three different tithes back in the day. Not all 10%, but they called them a tithe still. Levitical festival and charity tithes. 
Most uh, Old Testament scholars believe that the average Jewish person was giving 23% of their income per year. And then every seventh year, they would give an additional tithe in addition to that. So to that group of people whose normal habit was to give 23% of their income, to that group of people, Jesus said, hey, you've done a good job following the rules. <laughs> you've done a good job with the standard. But now, with that as the baseline, let's start talking about generosity. The assumption being that it starts somewhere after 23%. Now, I'm not trying to make that the case today, but here's what I would say. I think when we start thinking about generosity, every single one of us in the room, wherever you are in that scale and that spectrum, we've got a long way to go, myself included. But I'm telling you, this is such a powerful principle. Solomon leans in and he says, hey, you want to live differently. You, you, want, you want something to happen differently. I'm telling you, generosity is the way to go. Now, some of you, you hear this and you say, but where do I start? Let me give you this just in summary. Three big ideas that Solomon talks about. He says eliminate debt or avoid it if you're not in it. Second thing, save, budget. Third thing, be generous. Those three things, I'm telling you, will absolutely change the trajectory of your life. And this isn't even me telling you to give here. I'm just saying, be a generous person. Live with that kind of mentality. Live as a person with no debt. Live as a person that saves. It doesn't spend everything for the moment. And if you begin to do these things, it will change your life. It may save your marriage. But some of you hear this and you think, again, well, it feels a little too late. I've already created some habits like you talked about in your story, Chris, that have for years been with us and now I've created a backlog reminds me of this quote by John Maxwell he's one of the great leadership minds of our generation and he said this he said someone asked me how did you get so good John never lacked in self-confidence for the record he said that someone asked me how did you get so good and I replied by being so bad most people that you see in life that are good at something they didn't start off good at it it was repetition it was learning. What, I think this is a brilliant statement because what he's saying is you don't have to stay in the pattern. The reason he's a good communicator, the reason he's good on leadership thoughts is because at some point in his life, some point in his journey, he wasn't, but he decided not to stay there in that space. It's never too late to change course. You put these three together, and I'm telling you, based on the wisdom of Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, this will change your life. How do I know? Because Solomon says. <laughs> and because Chris tried all the other ways, and none of them worked. But I'm telling you, this is a different kind of way to live your life. So I want to give you a couple of things. I want to give you three wisdom questions as we wrap up. And then I want to take a moment for us to be able to pray over our students that are going to be going to camp. First one is this. Just kind of to process where you are. Just am I being wise or foolish with money? That's the first question. Like, that's where it starts. Like, just as you hear this, like, okay, am I... Am I being wise or am I being foolish? And which one do you want to be, right? Which life do you want to live? Which thing do you want to mark your life? Because, again, the decisions we make don't just affect us. They affect our community. They affect generations, right? So am I being wise or foolish with money? The second question is this. Which one is most difficult for me? The idea of debt, like either eliminating or avoiding it, as I talked about these, saving or being generous? Like, is there one of those that you have more put? Some are like, oh, saving's easy, but I do want to, you know, I'm going to carry this debt. Or I'm, I, giving is easy, but, man, I, I struggle with debt. Like, oftentimes these are all connected. But which one of these, just if you did a little soul search, which one is the most challenging for you? And then the last question is this. What is one action step that I can take in the next 48 hours? What's something that I can do? I want to I give you just a couple of things that maybe will jumpstart that for you. I've got some resources that I want to uh, put in front of you that have been really helpful to me through the years. Uh, one of them, some of you are in community groups. Some of you will jump into a community group in the fall. Uh, this is a great series. It's called If Money Talk, uh, 
that would be great to go through with a group of people. It talks about biblical principles. Uh, the Treasure Principle by Randy Alcorn is a fantastic book on generosity. The Total Money Makeover, this one is a game changer. It talks about everything from budgets to debt to practical things of how to get out of debt to investing, just the love, kind of one-on-one -on -one level of that. All really, really helpful stuff. That would be the starter one if you were just getting started. Um, Fields of Gold is an incredible one. And then I want to say this last one, from, from Paycheck to Purpose. Some of you are in a season of life. You're in your 40s or your 50s. You've done well. You've been successful. And you're in a season where you have an opportunity to make a massive difference. I would encourage you to pick up this book, From Paycheck to Purpose, because it talks about how to leave a legacy, not just for your family, but for the kingdom of God in the world. It's actually a really, really beautiful book from a business leader, not a pastor. And so, and then the last one that I, I've mentioned several weeks in a row, Tim uh, Keller has uh, got this book uh, on Proverbs that he and his wife wrote a devotional. And so I would encourage you, just take a step, start reading, pick up two or three people, read it together, read through the book of Proverbs together, and take some steps. But I'm telling you, uh, this, what we're talking about today, uh, if I could rewind, there's so many things I would do differently. And there were things along the way that Angie and I chose to do differently, and our lives have been very different as a result of it. So hopefully today, some of you got a thing in your mind. As I said, it, you're like, you know, that's the one for me. That's the thing. That's the step for me. Whatever it is, the next thing is attain wisdom. Don't just hear it. Ask yourself, what should I do? Maybe as simple as picking up a book and reading and getting started in the conversation. Some of you know the step you need to take. Just have the courage to take it. So I want to give you um, just what we're going to do here in a few minutes. Uh, in the next service, our students are all going to be joining us, middle school, high school students, a lot of the families that are going, uh, of the children of the students that are going to camp. And uh, we're doing something in the foyer every single week called Take Five. And this morning for Take Five, we've got cold brew coffee for you guys because it was too hot for hot coffee. That was early morning. Now we've got cold brew coffee, right? And the stir sticks, don't throw them away. They have the names of students and leaders that are going to camp. And I just don't want you to underestimate the power of prayer. I know it's a little bit cheesy, but I want you to pray this. When you get that stir stick and you put it somewhere that you can remember this week, they're going to take off on Tuesday. I want you to just pray that God stirs something in their life. Cheesy, but just do it, right? You'll remember. You'll remember. Pray that God stirs something in their life. I want, I want students to encounter God for the first time and realize there's a God that loves them. And that their identity is in him, not in all the stuff around them. How beautiful would that be? And we get to invest in that. And so as you get one of those stir sticks, again, you pray for the leaders, that they would have the wisdom to know what to say and how to be in safe spaces for, for teenagers. Uh, pray for safety for all of them. But pray that God would show up and do what God alone can do. And let's be a church that continues to let the next generation stand on our shoulders. So I want to close by just praying over them. You guys take five minutes in the foyer, meet some people, meet each other, grab the name of a student or adult to pray for, and uh, then we'll go on our way. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you saw fit to preserve wisdom like this for us. God, there is nothing today that we heard that is so profound that we can't understand it. But God, give us the courage to do it. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us strength and courage and boldness to walk this out. And then God, right now, I just pray for students. I pray for every student, every leader that will go off to camp this week. I pray that they would have fun. I pray they would be safe, but I pray it'd be so much more than that. I pray that they would encounter your love, God, through worship and through the spoken word and through community. I pray that they would feel accepted I pray that there would be students that for the first time feel, sense, and know what it's like to be a son or a daughter of the living God. And Father, we, uh, we lift our church to you that we would continue to be a church that platforms the next generation. We love you. In Jesus' precious and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for being here today. I want to encourage you, as Jim said, uh, continue to, to be generous through what's happening to support students, the next generation. So grab those stir sticks, some cold brew, and we'll see you guys in the foyer. Thanks.